pl please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, so this congregation, starting way back in February during Lent, we started looking at the book of Luke. And we looked at the book of Luke uh, through the eyes of uh, Reverend Adam Hamilton, who is the pastor of United Methodist Church of the Resurrection. He wrote a book that kind of helped frame this for us. Uh, and the idea was to learn more about what Jesus taught during his really brief three years of ministry on this, on this planet. And it always, some people get puzzled, why are there four different Gospels? Why are there four different stories? So I'm going to try to, in my own kind of weird way, explain that for you this morning. I want you to think about a marathon. Now we're writing a story or we're going to do a television story about a marathon. And we have four people that are helping us with that. So hopefully this gives you some perspective of how the Gospels work together. So we have four people. We're going to position them in different locations throughout the 26.2 mile course. And they each have a different perspective that they're focused on. So one of them is going to be writing the story or doing the television story based on the local community. So that the local community understands the impact of what's happening here. Another one, because we have a lot of international people who come in for marathons, we're going to write a story or do a television story based on the international folks who have come here. A third, a third example would be somebody who is going to write the story for the serious runners in our audience. The ones that are out there every morning running, getting in shape. They may not be running this marathon, but they're, they're getting prepared for another one. And then finally, one that's got what I call the color piece. They're going around and, and, and talking to the folks who are holding up the signs and cheering these people on as they go across this entire this entire uh, course. Now all of them are covering the same story. It's still the same marathon in the same city, but they've got different perspectives and they're from different locations. Some are on the inner circle where they're like, maybe one of them is actually on the lead car. I had the opportunity to take photos one time in the marathon in, in St. George, Utah, where I'm on the back of a pickup truck tailgate. They strap me in, and I'm taking photos of the leaders <laughs> as we're going down the highway. But some of them may be from the rooftop, shooting down you know, or, or, or watching and seeing what happens. And that's kind of the way the Gospels are. They're told from different perspectives, different people, and they each have their own particular focus. And that's what we've been doing with the book of Luke. And the book of Luke is written as a letter to a person named Theophilus. And Theophilus is, the whole idea is, they, the writer wants Theophilus to understand how important it was that Jesus lived, that Jesus died, and that Jesus was resurrected. That's the focus. And as we've gone through Luke, we've learned a few lessons about what did Jesus teach? Through the story of, of Simeon and Anna, we learn that God is more than willing to use the very young and the very old and all of us in between to proclaim the good news of who Jesus Christ is and the hope that's available through Jesus Christ. Through the story of Mary and Martha, we learn that Unlike the scenario or the, or the society that they lived in then, and honestly today, sometimes our own society, God values women. So much so that Jesus wanted to spend time with them teaching. Then we got into some parables and learning about how uh, sometimes God likes to help us be humbled a little bit and how he actually embraces humility in people who want to do better for themselves. Such as the, the idea of this, this parable between the, the uh, tax collector and the Pharisee. And then we learned a lesson in racial justice because there's a story about Jesus healing ten lepers. All ten of them run off, but one of them stops and comes back to say thank you, and it's the Samaritan. And it's a lesson for all of us that racial differences don't matter to God. Those are things that we as people put in our paths. And then we learned that to be a true disciple means to embrace being a servant. 
we told the story in the upper room about how Jesus washed the feet of people. And I asked the congregation that day, if you had one night, you knew it was your last night, what would you do with it? And I pondered myself, well, I'd go have a lot of fun. I'd want to make the most of that last night. And then we said, you know, it hits home when we remember that Jesus knew. And what did Jesus do with his last night? He washed feet. And then finally we learned that Jesus identifies with all people who have been outcast, including those who we tend to cast aside, the outlaws. I told the story of Daryl Burton, a friend of mine who was convicted and put in prison for 24 years for murder he didn't commit. And then he was finally released when the person recanted and DNA evidence showed that he couldn't have possibly been the person. Jesus was an innocent person who was crucified. Today we get to, those are kind of heady stories, they're tough stories in a way. Today we get to say, you know what? Jesus is risen. Today's the good stuff. Today's the great story. But it's one more time that the book of Luke comes through for us on this lesson that is throughout the book. We, woven throughout it is this idea that Jesus is here to lift up the outcast. To help those who are on the margins of society be pulled back into community with society because we are not supposed to be separated. We're supposed to be God's creation together. So we have two scenes we're going to look at today. The first one is the story that we are most, at least I'm thinking most of you are, are uh, most comfortable with. And that's the story that Gail read for you earlier. Women get up on that morning and go to the tomb. It starts when Jesus dies. Now we here on Sunday, we tend to think, oh, the Sabbath is Sunday, but that's not true. The Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Sunday is something that we Christians in the Western world kind of took over and, and made it the Sabbath, but that's not really it. And so Jesus dies on a Friday afternoon, and the sun's getting ready to set, and it's got, they got to get him down and put away, or else he's got to hang there until Sunday. So a rich man named Joseph from an area named uh, Arimathea decides to donate his tomb. Nobody's been in the tomb before. In other words, family members of generations like they typically would do, they weren't there yet. So this is brand new. And he's going to let this stranger, Jesus, be put away in it. The women that day who had watched Jesus be crucified in the distance, they follow them so they know where Jesus is going to be because they have a very important job. Today we embalm people. That was not a science back in those days. What they would do is they would apply spices and ointments and oils to the body as a way of kind of preserving the body, but more so as an act of cleansing and honor for the deceased. So they had that job. So what they did is they followed Jesus to know where the tomb is, so they know exactly where it is, and then they go home to prepare all of these things Saturday is the Sabbath. They get up on Sunday morning and they go to the tomb. And when they get there, the surprise of all surprises, this huge hundreds of pounds rock in, that's supposed to be the door is rolled away. And Jesus' body is not there. And there are two men dressed in these dazzling white robes are seen and they ask an important question that I think sometimes we in the 21st century forget to ask. Why are we looking for the dead among the living? Remember earlier I said one of the things we learned about in our, during our Lenten journey was that God values women. And this is the perfect example of it. Women in those days were considered not to be able to, uh, to have been uh, uh, witnesses in crimes or in court because they just didn't know what they were talking about. But who did God send to be the first witnesses to the most important story in the history of humanity? Women. And then who are the first evangelists? Who are the first ones to leave there and go out and proclaim that Jesus is risen? It's not the guys. The guys are hiding in a room. It's the women who are the first. So when we think of that Easter story, it's important for us to remember the role that the women played. 
Now, for most of us, when it comes to Easter Sunday, that's the story we start with, and that's the story we end with, because it's the cool one, right? The body's not there, the stone's rolled away, there's an angel or two angels, depending upon which of those gospel stories you read, and we're happy with that. Today, I want to take it one step further. Actually, I want to take you seven miles further on the road to Emmaus. Because later that very same Easter Sunday, there's another story in our scriptures that talk about an interaction with Jesus. And yet another time that Jesus teaches about lifting up the lowly. Our scripture comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. It goes like this. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, because his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have, have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us just went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to, him, said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets have talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself all in, all in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke with us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. Then those two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. We talk often about 12 disciples. At this point, there's 11, right? Because Judas is already gone. But there were way more than those. That was just the inner circle. There were a lot of other people, including women, who got around Jesus and traveled with him wherever he went. Two of those people are recorded in this story. We only get the name of one of them, Cleopas. The other, we don't know what his name is. They likely were in Jerusalem for the Passover. The map there shows that Emmaus is a little bit north and west of Jerusalem, and it's kind of a hilly walk. I didn't have to walk it when I was there. We rode on a bus. But you kind of feel that it's, this is not the easiest of, of, of walks. Uh, and it's seven miles. Now, it would have taken them about two hours to walk that seven miles because of the terrain. And as they're going along, they, you kind of get a feel for what it was probably like, because you can kind of envision, your, envision yourself in that scenario, right? You're walking around, you're not just not saying anything, you're talking about what had just happened. Think about what their last 48 hours had been like. They'd seen their teacher crucified. They had seen him absolutely beaten stabbed in the side while he was on, on the cross. And then they get this story from the women. It's kind of, in their mind, you kind of get the feeling that they weren't even sure about the women, but 
once Peter was there, it was okay <laughs> and saw it. And so what, they, what happens is that all of a sudden they've got this, I got to think they don't know what to do. They're, they've got to process it. So much happened in such a short amount of time. And then a stranger appears. And it's Jesus. But they don't know that. And I, I was kind of wondering, okay, so how did, what on earth, how did they not know who this guy was? Was it some magical way that Jesus hid his identity from them? Or have you ever been like this? What I call the time-space discontinuity. You know somebody from a certain place, a certain location, in a certain way. They dress a certain way. And then you see them somewhere else. And you're mystified and you can't really put your finger on who is that person. I remember one time we ran into my fifth grade teacher at a grocery store. And it took me forever to remember her name. I just did not pop to it because I wasn't used to seeing her in the, among the fruits and vegetables. I was used to seeing her in front of the classroom with the chalkboard. Yes, I said chalkboard. That dates me for you younger folks that are only have had whiteboards in your rooms. Uh, but Jesus teaches them one more time. They're talking about what happened, and then finally Jesus just gives them a lesson on the spot. He goes all the way back to Moses and teaches them all the things that have been taught about what was going to happen, dating back to the earliest days of our scriptures. They finally get to where they're going in Emmaus, and Jesus acts like he's going to walk on, but, but he says, no, they say, no, uh, stay with us for a little bit. It's late. It's dangerous out there. Why don't you stay here, enjoy food with us, and stay overnight? And so Jesus does. And then he does something kind of interesting. He breaks the bread. Now, there must have been something special about the way Jesus broke the bread because it was only then that they recognized who he was. Some unique way that he split that bread helped them understand, no matter what his face was, that that was the Christ, Jesus. And imagine their surprise. They had missed the encounter. Think of how they would have done differently, what they would have done differently, what their conversation, what their questions might have been if that, during that two-hour walk they had known that was Jesus right there. What would they have done differently? I've got to think that conversation would have gone way different than how it went. They still learned a lot because Jesus shared that information with them, but I've got to think they would have questioned more. Maybe they would have absorbed even more than what they did. And it makes me wonder... What do we as a people, so far separated by so many years, how often do we miss an encounter with Jesus? Because we're not paying attention. We don't expect to have an encounter. And so we let it go and we miss it completely. And what does that mean for us? How can we interact with Jesus? How can we encounter Jesus? Well, it could be as simple as running across a stranger just like a person walking into Emmaus. Maybe it's an opportunity to serve somebody else and we let it go. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to be served in a time when we need help. But we decide, no, we don't, we don't want any help, we don't need any help. Well, what if that person that was going to help us is the hands and feet of Christ? Maybe it's because we forget about recognizing the natural beauty around us. The creation. Now, I know, I know this can be a touchy subject, so I'm not going to get too far into it, but we need to ask ourselves, how do we make sure we have those encounters? How do we make sure we recognize those encounters? And I think it's we've got to open our minds to be attuned to it. Do we read Scripture on a daily basis? Do we pray on a regular basis? This is the touchy part. Dare I say we come to worship on a regular basis? How else do we build that connection if we aren't opening our minds to who Jesus is? The reason I say that is I don't want anybody to miss it. Don't miss the opportunity to interact with Christ. So how might you be missing out today? One of the things that those folks did not miss out on was the meaning of what had happened that morning. They may have missed Jesus walking with them, but trust me, they did not miss the meaning of what had happened. You see, just a few days earlier, they, all they knew were defeat. 
All they knew was the defeat. They knew that they were whipped. The Romans and the, and the religious leaders had conquered them, had forced them into hiding. But now they saw victory. All they had known was oppression. And all of a sudden they knew freedom. I sometimes wonder if we miss out on some of the things related to Jesus because we've never known a Jesus that wasn't alive. Think about it for a minute. Everyone in this room, we're, even if you feel like you're ancient, you are young, young, young from the standpoint of Jesus has always been alive while you've been alive. But the people back then knew what it was like for Jesus to be alive and then to be dead, for hope to be lost and then regained. We've never had that experience. Jesus has always been alive. Now, don't get me wrong, I think that's a blessing. I don't want to go through that sorrow of, of Jesus not being alive. But pick your metaphor on this day. There are four of them that we typically as Christians we tend to throw around and we tend to think of. And so pick the one that is best for you. They go like this. Jesus paid a ransom for our sin. That's true. Jesus sacrificed, him, sacrificed himself as a lamb as the slaughter for forgiveness. That's true. He purchased our redemption by giving his life on the cross. That's what happened. Or he was our substitute. Again, it's all true. Pick whichever one you like. Just remember that the bottom line, no matter what choice you make, is that Jesus Christ conquered sin and death for everyone, for all time, for all humanity. Indeed, for me, indeed, for you. And I think that's important because we have to understand, too, that man, are there some crucifixion moments in this life? We're not hanging from a cross, but wow, do we go through stuff. I don't know anybody, in, I don't know some of you, but I guarantee you there's nobody in this room that hasn't gone through some real bad times. We have suffering. We go through adversity. We have to experience sorrow. All of us have been defeated at some point in some way, and yes, all of us have faced death at some point. We have those crucifixion moments. But we also have what comes after. I told you uh, during prayer time, I had, I had the, ex the experience this week of going through two, two I saw memorial services, celebrations of life, whatever you want to say, um, two very, very different circumstances. On Wednesday morning, it was Neil Harrison, my wife's grandfather, combat war veteran from World War II, Purple Heart and Gold Cross Award winner. He was a POW in a Nazi war camp for a while. He ended up getting out of the service, rehabilitation. His leg never worked quite right. He had one leg that they had to have boots. He had to have uh, soles added to them so that he could walk straight because they had shot out his kneecap. And in that service, we had flag bearers, we had uh, uh, American Legion folks who were there, to, the Freedom Riders, uh, I think is what they're called, were there. Um, they were amazing. We had a guy playing the bagpipes in a kilt for crying out loud. It was amazing. And then on Friday night in the park, we had a service for Eric Castilli, an 18-year-old whose life just looked like it was just starting to bud, just starting to move along. Now, don't get me wrong, she lived a lot of life in 18 years, based on what, I didn't know her very well, but based on what I was told by her family. She wanted to be a flight nurse. If you don't understand what that means, these are the people that fly in on the helicopter, all they see is trauma. They see people on their worst day. And that's what she wanted to do with her life. The reason I tell you that story about those two people is because 
as I was listening to another pastor give a eulogy, or a homily rather, for a grandfather, and as I was preparing for one that I was going to be delivering, I kept coming back to something that I actually use in every memorial service, but I think it's important that we recognize it today on this Easter Sunday. And that's that the worst thing is never the last thing. If you don't get anything out of this today, I hope you remember that. The worst thing is never the last thing. Because there's one thing after that worst thing. And that is standing in the glory, the shadow of the glory of the Creator because of what Jesus Christ did and what we commemorate today. So He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Loving God, we don't know what to say or do. So many years ago, Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the Son, came to earth, taught us how to usher in the kingdom of God on earth, and even died for us, for our sins. We celebrate that death doesn't have to be the last word as we're reminded of the Easter story today. The tomb is empty. Help us to remember that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to keep in our hearts the good news of hope through Jesus Christ. And help us to better know that in the days, weeks, months, and even years ahead, that you are with us throughout. We're not on a road to Emmaus, but you're with us on every other road that we travel. And we give you thanks for that on this day. In the name of the risen Christ, a grateful people said, Amen.